You know, all these bayans and stuff like that, all these bayans you're seeing and you're doing, my advice is, is that it's uh, more than bayans is the need for your local efforts. That's my humble suggestion. Focus more on your local efforts. Do you know what I mean? Because the truth is, is that this is only literally a couple of percent of the work. Uh, we'll come and we'll go. We may mention something that inspires somebody, but the reality is, is that it's what you do afterwards. That's what really matters. So, like one brother upstairs, he mentioned it. He's not here, I don't believe. He's not here. He made a suggestion. He said, because he was thinking of doing a master's degree, I said, look, focus on building your community. Focus on building your youth. Yeah, that's okay. Alhamdulillah. Focus on building your youngsters. Because what, what the situation we've got now is that a lot of brothers are susceptible to, like, crimes. They're susceptible to gang violence or gang crimes, uh, joining gangs, incorrect affiliation. So if we can't provide the service for them in the house of Allah, uh, this is where somewhere where we could be falling short and this has got a lot of potential alhamdulillah Ask yourself. Why is it that youngsters are influenced and encouraged towards joining these sorts of things? We actually touched upon it upstairs Everyone knows it's wrong, but it's that kind of that thing people are missing out that there's that lack of tarbiyah from the parents There's that lack of connection and then there's that sort of gap and that void that exists within them And then they seek that affiliation respect love autonomy from outside you get it and they f they fill a gap and that's why these gangs and stuff are successful so i think one of the biggest needs of the day is is to create youth hubs as much as we possibly can and what we mean by youth hubs is to engage them in all different types of activities but to remind them that the key focus of why you're gathering is for the sake of allah do you get it that's your key purpose it shouldn't be any other reason we're not just getting together for the sake of getting together now off the back of events like these you should be thinking and strategizing how do you bring youngsters for the class that Molana was talking about. Do you know what I'm saying? Like the, the, the tafsir class, fiqh, and that sort of two days a week where we increase our Islamic knowledge. How, how can it be where when we stand for janaza, we know what we're reading? How do we, can it be as such where at least we know my surah fatiha? You know, these are the sort of questions we have to ask ourselves. Having a speaker come and go, mashallah, it's good, alhamdulillah, but it, the main focus should be the local effort. So the reason off the back, because you mentioned about people coming, these are all great suggestions, alhamdulillah. Really good. But your local effort is what really matters at this moment in time, more than anything else. At this moment, 53% of the people of our community are under the age of 19. That is 53.4 or 53.9, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a figure like that. It's a really big figure where the majority of our youth, they just, this is the recent census that came out. So I, I've, I, normally what I do is that I look in the communities, how many youngsters are below the age of 19? Because that's the real, litmus test of a community because that's the majority of your people now so when we're not we have what we have in our community we have a lot of youngsters that come up to the age of 13 they come from the bands and stuff and that's the truth is because you get me like they've got control over the youths and they bring them and then you have this massive gulf until like mid midlife and then that's when a lot of the community comes so you're literally we're missing out on 20 years of youngsters in the masjid of youth or up to the age of 35 i would say that's a general observation that's not a hard and fast rule but I'm saying that there's a big chunk. Now in our community, like I said, up to the age of 19, 53%, just say more than half, yeah, for argument's sake. If the census currently, currently sits at 4.2 million, again, roughly, that means we've got about 2.1, 2.2 million Muslims that are between the age of zero and 19. And the ones who are between zero and 10, at least they'll come, uh, they will spend some time uh, coming to the maktab, they'll come to the madrasa, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do something like that. But the reality is how many of them won't benefit? You know what I'm saying? Beyond this age, from the age of 14 onwards. So this why this class is really essential. I think it's a niche and it needs to be filled. And I think that there could be a lot more scope and potential. Alhamdulillah, you brothers here, you know, you should become, I don't know how regularly you guys come to the masjid, but you should make it a must to try and meet every single day, at least once in the house of Allah. You make it a must, make it a fard on yourselves. That every single day, we will try to come and meet in the house of Allah at least once. Be it an evening, after, and then make that an absolute must and it will regularly come on the weekends fix a day that we want to take to, yeah, we want to come to the masjid we want to spend more time in the house of Allah and once you start creating a community hub then alhamdulillah you start expanding on your activities you know you've got like a lot of like a lot, I would, I'd like to use the word greenery maybe if I can use that mm -hmm. you've got some like big big places you can go for walks and other things You've got it on your doorstep, man. Take the youngsters camping, you know, for example, the ulama, mashallah, oversee it, the committee and the brothers oversee it. But what's wrong with you giving them the five-minute nasiha? You five-minute nasiha. 
You know what I'm saying? You haven't got a big, big sheikh to do it. You just got to have a passion, man. If needs be, just go online and rob someone's behind and do it. Even that. The point is, you've got to want to speak from passion. These are, this is how I'm thinking, man. We need to create hubs, youth hubs, community hubs, youngsters in the house of Allah. Why, why is outside, like, man shotting mile on the road is attractive? Because they're showing them the love that you brothers aren't showing the youths outside. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying you brothers, but Masha, you're the practicing brothers. You go now to Burnley Town Centre, you will find boys on road smoking crack, shotting brown in their veins. Na'udhu I'm sorry to give you these examples, but these are the realities that are hitting our families, bro. You're going to have sisters, na'udhu billah, walking on road. Where's the ghira? Where's the gharat of iman that kicks in us to say, what's happening to our sisters? Getting violated by next man. Man's busting nuts and moving on in our sisters. Where's the gharat of us to think as a community? That what's happening to our kids? You know what I mean? So this is why I'm sorry this may sound a bit harsh. It's not hard. I'm not shouting or having a go. I'm, t I'm saying it from a place of passion. A fikr, concern that if we don't lock our communities now, we'd lost the plot. It, you know, Spain Muslim survived for 700 years. 700 years. At the rate we're going, it's only going to last another one or two generations if we don't fix up big time. So that's why, alhamdulillah, there's a lot of potential. These areas have a lot of potential. But the potential will only be there that if we utilize the masjid and really take advantage of the services that are offered and build brotherhood and put aside our differences. We need to learn to put aside our differences and work for the common good and the common goal. And the common goal is that we want to establish the deen of Allah. We want to bring our communities onto the deen. Gone are the discussions, Kiji, where you're trying your hands. Bro, these are dead discussions, man. Because these only broke our hearts up. You know what I mean? And these, these areas, you have these discussions. So, I laugh a bit. I not like I want to you know, mention anything negative because the purpose is not. It's rather to focus on the positive. But if there was no positivity, if there was no possibility, I would say that you know, there, it's, a done, it's a dead cause. But that's not the case. You guys have got a lot of potential. Alhamdulillah. You've got a masjid that is willing to cooperate with you. Unfortunately, some masjid have closed their doors to ideas even like this. Whoever wants to do that, that's their business. Fine. We'll work with the brothers who are providing you that platform and utilize it with the guidance of the ulama and the committee. You take their advice that this is what we want to do. Can we have suggestions how we want to do it as a community? How do we roll with this? Take their guidance and do it. But this is one of the biggest things we need to do. There needs to be a, a fikr, mustaqil, constant, concerted effort. How do we save our youngster from going to haram? And it has to be an effort which is ongoing. It can't just be a one-off program. It, this serves as a springboard. You know what I mean? We're like midlife now, you get me? We hit the 40 mark. So if he went to his school and said to his friends, listen, there's a really good program that's gonna happen in the mosque, you gotta come. After the band, we're gonna sit down and have pizzas, we're gonna have a chat with one of the local scholars, and you know, once a month we're gonna get around a campfire, someone's gonna tell us Islamic stories. And all it's gotta be is somewhere where the youngsters feel that comfortable, they don't feel judged, they can speak. Youngsters are talking to youngsters. You know what I mean? Your, your five minute speech will be more effective than mine because they're going to look at you and think, I can relate to this person, we're same age. Do you understand? Give it a few more years and my hair's become white, it will become irrelevant to the people. People will say he's a different generation, automatically, you just won't be able to click. Thank God because I'm half Gora, I've got good genes. Still, we're doing all right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So Alhamdulillah, we're still doing okay. Not to say that, obviously, we're not looking old, we're still getting there, right? slowly, slowly. But the point is, is that you can do so much more effort. I'll tell you one story about one brother. He was in Brazil. <coughs> Masha'Allah, he got involved in da'wah locally. And alhamdulillah, I'll tell you a cut story, just a story cut short. What he did was, is that he, he started making effort locally, trying to get people to come to the house of Allah. He would, he'd go home, park his bike, walk and talk to people and say, look, well, let's go to the masjid, man. We're Muslims, Allah made us Muslims. Our success isn't following Islam. So let's go to the house of Allah. So this young, young, one youngster, he made so much effort in six months he, he passed away when he was 16 years old. But the amazing thing is, where he, is this, where, he was he, where he was making that effort has now become one of the main da'wah centers of the country. Because he planted seeds. In, in that effort of time, God knows what effort he was making, but he did it with sincerity. Now he passed away at a very tender age, but alhamdulillah, all those efforts now that came afterwards, he's getting the reward for it and he doesn't even know. He'll know on the day of judgment how many people become hufaz and ulama and, MashaAllah, how many people served their communities, established the deen of Allah. 
You know what I mean? So this is why, don't ever underestimate that, oh, what am I going to do? I'm just a, you know, just a person amongst many. Or even the worst, oh, you more vina gum. Kriti's gum. No, it's yours. You're, you're Balig individuals. Your responsibility as well. Anyone who has the capacity to inform others, they need to inform them. Yeah. So we have to take it on our shoulders as a responsibility. That, yeah, like, you allow me to, the tawfiq, to be able to benefit my community and others as well. And make an effort, mustaqil, seriously. Once a month, regularly, fix a date as well. If you have it fixed, like, I don't know, the last Saturday of every month, we're going to have a mad vibe in the masjid. We're going to get all the youngsters and we're going to just jam in the masjid. Like in a halal way, of course. <laughs> I mean, jam as in, yeah. Just, but the point is, is that, do you get it? It's like you can, you know, why not utilize the house of Allah for that? I'm telling you, you know, the truth is, wholesome brotherhood is something so desperately needed. Why do our youngsters feel influenced to go outside and join other haram activities? Because they don't have it in the house of Allah. And I'm not saying this, mas uh, this masjid has got such potential that you, they do it already. We just need to enhance it more. But the youngsters need to take it on their responsibility. You guys, mashallah, if you guys do this, wallahi, you'll all be, all these hasanat will go in your account. In, in our local area, a couple of young brothers, they started making effort. And alhamdulillah, off the back of that, a good couple of boys became half of the Quran. A couple of them went to go abroad to study the deen. Now they're ulama and mashaykh in our area. Where did it start? Wallahi, youngsters. Youngsters were the means of them coming onto the deen. We've got countless stories like this. Countless stories. There's potential, man. I have a question. So your bayan is about education. Yeah. Um, what subject do you think um, is being taught in school that should... What subject do you think that's not being taught in school that should be taught today at the elementary level? At elementary level, Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. It's void completely. There is no discussion on God. Everything's anti-God. This is the problem. Even the whole concept of, uh, of, of hum uh, Darwinism, uh, evolution, is taught to kids. We have to counter that. And we do, alhamdulillah, in my madrasa, we counter that. We talk about the creation of Adam alayhi salam and Hawa, and we really talk about this. From a kid's level, you can't go in there and start saying, Allah ta'ala, ya you the bro, the youths, you get me? So you've got to come down to their level, but you teach them accordingly. But Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, definitely. That's the bigger, biggest thing that the kids aren't being taught. So we have to provide that. Teaching kids about, to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, that's the first thing. Second thing after that about Nabu and Risala, for them to have yaqeen in the words of the Prophet sallallahu then for them to understand that the Qur'an is the glam of Allah. That is our, that is our constitution of a living. And for these, everything's against this. It may not be a conscious effort, maybe, wallahu alam. But we have a responsibility to educate our kids. And they, we can't use this thing of you, you know, bro, listen, that excuse ain't gonna run. Because you managed to build yourself five gortis in Pindi, so why couldn't you make effort on your kids? You know what I'm saying? So you can't run with that excuse. It was an issue of priorities. That's it, issue of priorities. Because if someone put a gun to your head and say you have to produce this result and you've got 15 minutes to do it, you'd find some way out to do it. If you someone, if life and death situation, wallahi, you'd be surprised what human beings can achieve. We do not use the deen as a priority. Only when something really hits the fan and hell breaks loose, then it's like, you more difficult, You know what I mean, bro, that time the harm is set in. When I mean tawheed, in the discussion of Allah, the oneness of Allah, that's what I mean by tawheed, yeah? Talking about Allah, the sifat of Allah, Allah is the creator, He's all merciful, He's all powerful. These are the correct discussions we have to have. Because if the seed of Tawheed can be planted within the heart and mind of that kid, mashallah, hopefully there'll be a hope that that person, that, that won't be the be all and end all. Okay, mashallah, done my job. Chutti. Back to the taxi again. No, you work on them. And it's a constant thing that happens, but you've instilled it within their heart and mind. Inshallah. You know, that's, what, that's what I feel. But there are other things as well. But that is, you asked me what is the most important thing, and I think that everything rests on Tawheed. If you haven't got Tawheed, you've got nothing else. That if you've got no foundation of faith, what have you got? Because I'm not here to say non-Muslims are bad people. They're not. Inherently, they're not bad people. I'm half English, by the way. Yeah, I told you that, innit? My family are nice people. They are really good people. Sadly, they're just not Muslim. So if they don't accept Islam and reject Islam, then we know what is the ahwal of a kafir in the akhirah. And there's no point sugarcoating it. Do you know what I'm saying? So obviously we know Allah is just, He's, he's adil, he will, he will, al-adil, He'll do what is right. But if somebody rejects it and says, I don't accept what you're saying, that's rejection, that's clear-cut kufr. 
We, there's, what can we do for people like that? We just have to hope and pray that one day they do accept. We have to just keep on making the effort, inshallah. But well, like English people are nice people, man. A chill organ. How tolerant are English people that despite the constant negative media, you still see people with a smile to some extent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 the heat is bubbling. Do you know why that is? Because we haven't done our job. Wherever Muslims went, they enriched society. Wallah al with proper establishment of the deen of Allah come, will come justice, adl and insaf, properly. We pick and choose our deen, cherry pick it. We cherry pick our Islam according to what suits us. So we have a brother that doesn't pray salah, goes out clubbing every night, he just wants to know, bro, tell my, tell me, tell my wife what is her haq to serve her husband. Well, insan, like you're, you, you, everything that comes to you, you, you want to violate the deen. Just this one part. No, one guy goes like he was saying, I, I, I want to get I'm married more than once. Oh, you know, okay, that's one part. You sunnah there. Well, it's funny, you didn't read the other sunnahs. What about the other sunnahs? What about the faraiz? Oh, oh we got on that. Well, it's sunnah. Bro, deen's not a pick and mix. It's not a buffet at Nawab. You can just pick and choose the kebab and tikka and fish. Na'udhu billah. It's a whole package. And this is the problem. You know what it is? We've become selected deen, selected. And people see this. They say these are hypocrites. One side they preach Islam, but they don't practice it. So we're hypocrites, na'udhu billah. Not the munafiq as in munafiqoon. We're not munafiq. We haven't got nifaq. We believe in Islam. But we have traits of munafiqin where we say something and do something else. So, yeah, man, these are issues we're going to grapple with. People, you know, the world is a, is a global village now. All they've got to do is Google what the Islam means. And they say, well, look at these Muslims, bro. They're, they're, it's their religion. They're not supposed to be drinking. Abdul, you're not supposed to be drinking. Abdul, you're not supposed to be, you know, I thought you're not allowed to have a girlfriend. Abdul, I thought you're not allowed to take drugs. Or oh, part-time Muslim, bro. Yeah, sorry, part-time Eid, Eid Muslim, Jummah Muslim. Ajee, man. I, this just really upsets me because, you know, you know, the harm has been done so much that it will take double the effort now to bring them back to normality. And I think these people have a haq over us that we should present them the right picture of Islam. If they choose to accept, fine, alhamdulillah. If they don't, at least we tried to give the message out. Because reality, they've given us more than we've given them. We identify as English Muslims. That's why when we go to Pakistan, they look at us as like, eh, di, eh, chale loka, the Englandese. And we look at them as freshies. Anyway, point is, is that it's, uh, my, my point is, if I, I, I look at England as, as home, you know what I mean? And I don't look at Muslims living here for five years or 20 years. I look at the longevity of it. Otherwise, why be here? If you genuinely know you're not going to be here, then leave. Just go, alhamdulillah, you know, go to, to a quote unquote Muslim country. But if we're going to stay here, we should stay with the aim of establishing the deen of Allah for the benefit of mankind. Because I believe that in mankind's benefit, we'll be in following the law of Allah and the law of the Prophet I strongly, I, wallah, I believe that in every sense of the word. I don't believe in ism and this theory and that theory and so on. I believe in the Quran and hadith. I believe in the Quran as the constitution of mankind. That's my, that's my starting point. You know what I mean? And if, we, if we're not here to establish that, then we're doing an injustice. Sorry, so you're a bit of a uh, tangent, but Jazakum Allah for your question. It's a good question, and I, I think the way to do it is to be firstly open to it. But wallahi, we shouldn't be snowflakes. That's another thing. That's another extreme that exists. Oh, I can't work, bro. Oh, I've got depression. I can't work. Oh, I've got depression. I've got mental health. When you're, when you're feeling low, you're feeling slightly quote unquote depressed, what's the first thing that you're going to feel a lack of? Sorry? Energy. En energy. That's the first step. Energy. Before anything, you feel like, oh, I can't you have a lack of energy. When you have a lack of energy, then what do you do? Lack of, mo lack of motivation, which leads to lack of activity. When you have a lack of activity of something which you know you should do, there's an increase in guilt because you know you should be doing what you should be doing. Are you, are you following the steps here? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now there's increase in guilt. There's more decrease, more, more decrease energy which is going to lead to more depression, which is going to make you feel less energetic, which is going to make you less energetic to do the thing you do, makes you feel more guilty, makes you feel more, it's like a vicious cycle that keeps on going on. Now, how do you reverse this? Wallahi, I'll give you a piece of advice and it's the easiest way. And I use this with my own clients, okay? For free, I'll give it to you. There's two things. If, if, you, if you were to go to a doctor or a mental health professional and say, I've been struggling with um, not feeling myself for X amount of time, the doctor will, the first question they'll ask you is, Tell me the symptom and onset. When did it come and how long did it last for? 
How long has it been going on for? And so on. If you say, I've been feeling like this for the past week, they'll say, it's okay, it'll come and go. Tell us how you feel in a week. The starting point to quote unquote, where they start to raise alarm bells is the minimum two weeks, not less than that. So if you were to go to a doctor and say, I have been isolating myself, I don't want to talk to people for the past month, and I feel no energy and I don't want to talk to people, I'm isolated. All right, this is the start of a problem. This is the start of a problem because it's gone on too long. Do you understand what I'm saying, yeah? All right, so now I've said that, understand this. So anything which is now a doctor needs to get involved with, we're not talking about here. This is now for therapy. But before this stage of just feeling low a couple of days, how do you snap out of it? And this is what I'm talking about, this circle, yeah? It's as easy as doing an activity that will bring you a sense of joy and utility. Wallahi, it's as simple as that. Now, what do you like to do, for example? And I'm not saying you struggle, but you as an example, tell me something you like to do. Maybe go gym. Gym? Uh, cool. Anyone else? Anyone to share anything? Yeah, what else is there? If anyone says I watch Star Plus dramas or Nick Godson, Nicolo, Tere Asteni, Majlis, Nicolo. But joking anyway. But on another note, on a halal thing, who, any other examples of ideas of what you guys like? Yeah, it's, it's a valid thing. Because what it, there's two things. One is the eating itself and there's the socializing with the people. So there's a double aspect there. Anything else? Ch yeah, that, these are all valid things. Chilling with people, relaxing with people. That's also because human connection. It could be other things. Reading, studying. Some people enjoy studying. Because you're in, enhancing your brain, you're, you're developing. Yeah? So, include, like, someone to play PlayStation or something. Anything, Monana. It's basically anything which makes you feel happy. PlayStation is an example. Obviously, depending on the level of the games and what you play, that's where the question arises, because some things can make matters worse. Yeah, so if, if, you're, if you're playing a game where it's constant violence, and you get more points for shooting the person in the face, well, that's a bit of a problem. You know what I mean? That's, that's not healthy. That's not healthy gaming, you get me? It needs to be a constructive type of thing. Well, <laughs> sorry? Yeah, there was a little bit of building, plenty of shooting as well, but yeah. But, but you get my point. Now, for example, I would never advise anyone to play Grand Theft Auto, for example, or GTA 5, for example. You're going up to someone's ear of Atto and smack them with a baseball bat. Like, what the heck is going on, bro? Like, it's just deadly. However, reading, like I said, studying, going out, gym, family, friends, eat, whatever the case may be. The point is, when you start feeling low, quote unquote, your mental health is suffering, you're starting to feel a bit depressed. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to have a lack of energy, lack of activity, lack of motivation. It's going to have increased guilt and it's going to keep on have this vicious circle and it will keep on getting worse. Then it starts the one day, two day, three day, four day, five day. And then when you hit the two week mark, then this circle is not going to easily work as well. It's going to, it's going to keep on getting worse. But now someone for three days, they've been starting to feel low. You, bro, listen, the most easiest way to snap out of the problem is to increase activity of something that you know you like. However, one thing which we're not good at doing is asking for help because it's considered a weakness. So why I say if you involve yourself in doing certain activities which brings you a sense of happiness, it won't make you feel da -da, perfect, like, all good, mashallah. But the good thing is having an activity, doing an activity it gives you a sense of fulfillment and happiness. Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm so proud of myself I did that, man. I'm really glad. That increases your optimism and that increases your energy. And then you're like, Alhamdulillah, I feel good. I feel Bro, you know when you go to the gym, yeah? However ironic it is, what is that feeling like? Even the next day your body is hurting, what's that feeling like? You put your body under stress and you receive pleasure from that. That's the whole point because endorphins are released in your body. Any activity you do, you'll get endorphins that release. Reading, gym, biking, anything. There's so many different activities. But if you're feeling low, you know doing that will make you feel good. Force yourself to do it. And, have, and that's why I said brotherhood is so important. Because by day, look, subhanAllah, look how in tune the Sahaba were. Wallahi, you don't understand. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu woke up, uh, played Salat al-Fajr, and he's scanning the majma. And he notices one Sahabi is not there. Now, of all the Sahaba, one's not there. He goes and knocks on his door. Where's the Sahabi? And his mum had mentioned he prayed Tahajjud all night, but he didn't make it for the Jama'ah. He went to see, pray Fajr awal in time and went to sleep. Umar radiallahu anhu mentioned it's better for him to be hadir and be present for the Fajr Jama'ah rather than doing Tahajjud by himself. Now, look how in tune the Sahaba were to the, each other's needs. That's the sort of hub and spirituality you need to build amongst your brothers. Uh, what's your name, brother? Sorry? Bilal. Bilal. So, uh, so, and your name, Akhi? So let's just say, for example, Bilal comes to the masjid one evening and he asks, he's like, Zishan in here this evening. 
All right, cool. Let me see you on your cool, bro. We didn't see you. Is everything cool? All right, cool. Maybe in tomorrow, inshallah. I'm just busy with college. No problem, bro. See you tomorrow. By day two, by day three, if man's not coming to the masjid, Bilal should be taking your name, brother. A man and going to Zishan and say, bro, we'd come to see you. Is everything all right? Like three days? Like what's happening? Because it becomes a pattern. But by third day, pay that visit to that brother. You have to take out time for your community members, man. And they'll reciprocate for you. They'll remember you in times of need as well. Like, where's Bilal, man? Bali, get away. That's the car. That's the car. I don't know if you guys drink tea, but hint, hint. This sadeh logo, I didn't get it. But anyway, the point is, is that these are just ways, isn't it? You see? And then, like that, you increase your activity. Me, personally, I'm an extrovert. So I love being around people. I love it. So my buzz is that if I isolate one or two days, yo, I know if I force myself, I'm going to sit there angry for the first 30 minutes. After I'll feel right again. So you need to spot each other's signs and say, yar, my, and wallah, that's how our community is formed, man. Seriously, this is what we need so badly. Wallahi, we need this so badly. It's not all about money, man. Money alone does not make you happy. I'm telling you. Money alone doesn't make you happy just by knowing I've got lots of money. It helps. It, oh, of course. I mean, it's better to be depressed in a beamer than the bus. <laughs> However, but just having loads of money itself, it, after a while, you know, it's like he knows he's got, he can buy anything he wants. It's, it, the novelty wears off. You, you don't feel happy more than six months for anything. Let's just say you just achieved the latest qualification that you wanted. One month you'll buzz, two months, three months. By the, by the sixth month, it's gone. You no longer get so high off that anymore. Why is it they release cars every six months? Because you'd get bored with yours in six months. Bro, these things are thought out. They're very well thought out. Why not release a car every year? Why six months? Okay, why not every four months? Because they know that the maximum time after six months, majority of people will lose interest. So every six months, novelty wears off. So let's just say today's achievement, right? You've got six months to rinse that achievement. After that, it might be for you two months, might be four months, but the maximum is six months. After that, now you're looking for something else. I've just struck a business deal. Alhamdulillah, we're smashing it. Six months, okay, fine. After that, I'm farig, bro. I'm not doing nothing. But you made so much money, like six months ago, yeah, but I'm bored. Human beings need novelty all the time. You get it? So that's why I said that you need to, human beings need to, con just having money doesn't mean a lot. It, having money for billionaires and is not even the money. It's the, str it's the acquisition of the money which gives them the bus. It's knowing that I've worked so hard and I've got it. I'm, I'm not, no one can conquer me. I'm unconquerable. I smashed it. I attained. I got my goal. But if they were to just sit idle, like I asked, why don't people like Bill Gates retire? It's not the money. It's the acquisition of the money which gives them the buzz. Do you understand? So money itself won't give you the sense of your utility. It's the sense of achievement. You can get a sense of achievement by doing other things as well. When you see achievement, that's when it's that real buzz for you. Like, subhanAllah, we're making difference in the lives of our community. And wallahi, you know, the biggest results you will produce is not money. It's the people around you. If the strategy was money, then the Prophet ﷺ would order Sahaba to make janda, build a fantastic masjid and say, Ji, khud khud people will come automatically. It did not focus like that. It was other way around. Focus on the needs of the people. We have to do the same thing, man. Prophetic sunnah is not just, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, alhamdulillah, you have the zahir or the sunnah zawaid, imama, these things. What, what, that's respectable in its own place. But what about these sorts of things for our community? So Bilal, but that I went on a mad tangent, bro. Sajig led the mental health. See, look where I went. I, tell, I, I really go off on a tangent on my question, but come back here to your point. It's how you can work on this as a community is being there in support of one another. That's the long and short of the answer. Being there and support for one another. If you completely isolate yourself from one another, you won't know no different. So we have to spot the signs. How, how, what would your advice be for, so you know you're a psychotherapist yeah. and you're also a Mulan and Yeah. Um, what would your advice be like, what would you prioritize first? Because I also want to go into psychotherapy. How old are you? Uh, uh, 18. Why do you want to get into psychotherapy? Because, uh, I mean, I've just always been interested in psychotherapy. Yeah. It's very heavy of a field. I'm not discouraging from it. Yeah. But obviously one thing is having command over how people think and, you know, that sort of thing. It can be used as a very much a good tool. At the same time, it's got to be, you've got to understand that you have your limitations and you have something called burnout and it's really real. 
Because if you're constantly, people don't come to you when they're happy, they come to you when they're at your, their worst. And to hear that constantly is so challenging. So what I would advise you to do before you make an, uh, like a decision, get okay, this is what I want to do. What I would advise you to do is that, have you, are you doing A-levels at the moment? I'm in uni. So what are you doing? Like, sorry, how old are you? 18. And you're already in uni? Yeah. Okay, what are you studying in uni? I'm doing psychology right now. Alhamdulillah, perfect. Finish your psychology first. That's the first step. Yeah. Then once you finish that, then it's easy to transition into doing a professional diploma. Or you can go into a master's in counselling. Three years and you can become a practicing counsellor. But my advice is, is that if you're serious, finish your first year of psychology, get, understand the theories of psychology properly. The main schools of thought, understand, and read a lot of books. Keep on consuming knowledge, man. Understand the Islamic paradigm as well. There's a lot of books written on Islamic psychology. Uh, what's her name, man? Uh, Aisha, uh, I think it's her name, UTZ, I forgot her surname. You've got Professor Ghulam Hussain Rasul Sahib, solid geezer. He's here at the moment in the UK. He's from Mauritius, solid. Then you've got writings of um, uh, Malik Badri, for example, Sudan, Sudanese sheikh, he's a psycho psychotherapist. You have, you know, the, I think it's called the IIPI, you've got their stuff. So the point is, there's a lot of material. And it's not reading the whole thing. Take a niche that you think is interesting and read up about it. You'll naturally find, for me, it was a relationships and couples. That was my sort of, my, 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 my sort of inclination to say. That and then working with youngsters. Because I believe that if work, saving, working on the youth, you save your communities. And working on the couples, you safeguard the youth. So it's that hand in hand stuff, you get me? It's fascinating work, Alhamdulillah, but it's very taxing, very heavy. And really, sadly, our community won't value it. Because we don't value this sort of stuff. So if you're thinking, oh, I want to serve my community, my advice to you is carry on with your psychology. Even you can get into clinical psychology. That's another field, we need people. But if you're doing a generic psychology course, right? Yeah, automatically you'll find something that your, you, your heart unconsciously will just connect to something. You know, it, it will. Like my studies, I was thinking, where do I specialize? But automatically your heart just levitates towards a certain area. But with that, having said that, uh, I, I, I proposed this last time I was here. And that is that if you can get maybe a couple of brothers to do like a trainee counseling course, be there as support. We need youth support workers. And if you just do like a basic level two, level three, it gives you the basic skills on how to talk to people. You know, like if you talk to someone and all they want to do is interrupt and say, Bro, you're not gonna you're not gonna get through to anybody. Let them talk. You know, learn there's a skill of listening, active listening is a skill. And if you break the confidence of people or you are judgmental, people will never come back to you. So there's loads of things you have to learn and you know understand that people play games. Like people say things just to be mean to see how you'll react before they can trust you. So you gotta understand, you gotta basically when you learn psychology and counseling, you learn people. I've always been fascinated about people, always. I've always been fascinated by being around people, what makes people tick. And there's also other fields as well, there's dark psychology too. Mind games, tricks, twists, making people think that question their own sanity. That's twisted. I mean, but you have that as a field. And then you have positive psychology, Martin Seligman, all about positivity. So there's so many different fields, man. Attachment theory, another big one, yeah, alhamdulillah. So yeah, I mean, try to, hopefully, if you can set up a counselling hub, when youngsters come, you know, like, have those skills, to do it like level two or three, it'd take you a couple of years, man, and then you have those skills, that they're useful for life. And you, the truth is, a youngster will come to you, and, and if you're one of the local brothers, the shabab, they'll come to you because they feel comfortable with you. Generally, it's quite unfortunate, but people have, a negative perception about ulama, not that they're hon horrible people, it's just because they are jokidar of the sharia, ah, you get me, like the protectors, that's their job. And they see anything at the sharia, ah, they're gonna speak up. So when it comes to brothers like yourselves, they look at you in a different capacity, you're one of the akis, you get me, like one of the, like the akis of the masjid. Yeah, the other thing, uh, yeah. he's also got intention to study deen. Yeah, good. So how, can he, how can he balance that between the two? You can, the you can. Uh, well, now you've already started the psychology, I would never advise to leave that. I would advise to stay, and alhamdulillah, you have these course that, this course that Malana was talking about, join that. Join that course, be part of that course, and try to kind of like take time out on a regular basis. Become readers as well, man. Like take advice of ulama, like what, what should I study? Like give me an example of some things I should study. Give me some ideas of books. Is there any, let me ask you guys, is there any sort of genre of books that you actually like to read? Is there something you like? Have you ever read something that really you connected to? Me personally, I like to read uh, stuff related to history. I'm a big fan, big, big fan. History is the subject which I love to read the most. 
because history repeats itself. So if you're more aware of your history, you know how to tackle things in the future. So read things, exchange ideas, sit in the, I think sitting in the company of ulama is good. You can pick their brains, like similar how you're doing to me, do it for your local ulama, you build up the connection, inshallah. Every alim has their own sort of niche and their thing which they like. So you're talking about someone who is working locally, they, they study, they can attend their local masajid. Alhamdulillah, that's good for them. And then you have those categories of people that are busy Monday to Friday, look for a weekend class locally. Let's just say next man's in the middle of nowhere and he's just got some mad uni and some sticks, bruv. Then basically, join an online class. So the point is, is that you can do these little courses too. Try to, my advice is, is always try to seek ilm face to face. That's the most effective. Because there's a double benefit in that. It's not like once you, you know, look at a screen and then switch off, buck you back to your normal again. After the bayan, you know, you meet people, you talk to people, there's that brotherhood, it's, it's, you have that as well, you know what I mean? So that's the also added benefit. There's the added benefit of talking to a fellow brother, you know, I haven't seen you for a couple of days, how are things going, mashallah, how's life, how's college, how's study? Da, da, da. And that's your kind of outlet and your ta'aluk and uh, connection with the brothers. So I always advise face-to-face. If face-to-face isn't possible, then don't deprive yourself from something online. If you want to take my advice on a course online, mark my words, do the Londonia course by Muhammad Hijab. Londonia. Bro, trust me. Go to a Sapiens Institute or just type in Muhammad Hijab, Londonia. It will come up. It's a fantastic course. Watch every video and learn every argument. And go out there and do da'wah. Allah di kasmi, yaar. We need youngsters like this, bruv. We have to invite. Your people's job. And we don't learn knowledge to debate, aliyadu billah, it's to give people the call of Tawheed. This is the reality, this is your Akhirah, this is not my God, your God. They have either Ayera courses that's more Dawah related, I, invite, I advise the brothers to go and attend those. Ayera, Ayera literally, Ayed or Era. Yes, they're very good, Dawah fo- focused and they're run by, mashallah, some brothers in London. But the Sapiens is good, mashallah, the Londonia stuff. Do that, they're very beneficial. If options aren't locally impossible, then move towards online. But even if you haven't, you have got options locally, do listen to the hit and the near thing. Take time out for that. Put it as a playlist and listen to it religiously and take notes. There's so much material online, you know that? Decent material. But I would advise, take advice from ulama. Don't just be randomly surfing videos. Because you'll start one place and then eventually you'll end up on OnlyFans, bruv. <laughs>
So our people, and I mean our people, I'm talking general sort of within the Asian subcontinent and Muslims in general, but this is Asian subcontinent, more of a marad. We eat roti at like 10 o'clock at night. We're ordering pizzas at what, 2 o'clock in the morning. Gore don't do this, bro. They're asleep at bed like 12 o'clock, but they don't even know until 10 o'clock at night. They wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. We have to live like people from the Gra. Literally, like, that's the best way. You see them waking up 6 o'clock in the morning ready to look after the majan. That's, that's what you call grafting. It, you know, I, I read this one quote and I'll never forget it. It was so profound, subhanAllah. He said, how do you expect the sun of Islam to rise? The sun, as in the suraj of Islam to rise. When the sons of Islam are sleeping till beyond sunrise. I read that, I was like, whoa, that's so deep. We want, mashallah, the son of Islam, you know, to show its roshni. Where, where, where's the Muslims? They're sleeping till Zohar. Rather, we're at night and not on Coventry Road, riding 50,000 pound cars from Shotting Mal. You know, let's look at our priorities, man. We're so skewed. person struggling, have a detox from social media, cut it off completely, one or two months as much as possible. If that's the avenue where someone's being affected, and you'll know, because a lot of people, a lot of people complain that as soon as they come off social media, they don't feel it pumped, they feel deflated. Because you're, they're showing you stuff that is constantly which you're aspiring to. It's not like something which you're not attracted to, you're attracted to haram. That's why there's the temptation. If haram wasn't temptation, tempting, you'd say it's not even a test. The fact is, you are tempted to women, you are tem you're tempted to drugs, you're tempted to the nightlife, it's, it's got an attraction to it. Now you go to the town centre, Burnley, wherever, you're going to see like mad vibes kicking off in town, you're going to be like, damn, they look like they're having fun. Everyone's happy, smiling, you know, everyone's cheering, yeah, let's go, like, let's go for it. And you think, yeah, I just come from the masjid, you know, eating salan. You know, now, this, 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 what's the shaitan's going to put in your head? You know, I'm just smelling of curry, bruv. Just a freshie. Now, you know, this is, the, this is what shaitan's going to make you think. It, it, it's not like, Alhamdulillah, I did something spiritual, I was in the, but the more you're with brothers, Wallahi, are they going to fill that gap and that void? Then you'll feel part of brotherhood. I'm telling you, man, wholesome brotherhood is the, is the best, this is what our youngsters need. So like this, inshallah, you know, just well, don't listen to people too much. Our community is in denial about mental health as well. But however, however, we also, we shouldn't become complete snowflakes as well. Like for example, oh, I can't get a job, bro. Well, I'll get, I'll get bare anxiety. I'll just get bare anxiety. Like one brother, but I, this is a funny one because I saw him in the gym and like he was pushing and like pumping bare weights and muscles and talking to people and like, what are you doing for a job now? Like, bro, I can't do nothing, bro, I've got bare anxiety. Is there any anxiety on your gym, Mitch? Like, you, you, you see, it's just like selective. Oh, I just feel anxiety. It's like giving a label to someone destabilizes them, debilitates them. So don't fall for this, we'll grind through it. And understand that Allah wa ta'ala has sent things down as a test. This is just a way to test you sometimes. All the time, everything in life's a test. What books have you read so far? What ones have you read so far? Um, so there's a book um, currently talking about the conquests of um, the, Tur um, the Turkish people. Um, the Ottomans, yeah. Yeah, um, and um, like the Mughals, um, mm. how, how they came around. Who's the author? Um, so. If you like history, Karen Armstrong wrote a short history of Islam. She also wrote a Sila book, Karen Armstrong. That's a good one. She's a nun. She's a nun and she wrote Islam. Really nice. Alhamdulillah. A couple of things I didn't agree on, but generally it's all right. It's a good reading, English reading book. Nice and easy. Then there's another book written by Firas al Khatib. Lost Islamic History. Very nice. Alhamdulillah. Solid kitab. Then you've got another one, which is called The Islamic History of Spain. That's a thick one. Fantastic book. That's Spain particularly. Then another one which is also very, I mean there's so many, subhanAllah, you've got Jazairi, D-J-A-Z-A-R-R-Y, A-I-R-I, Jazairi. If you write in Crusades and the word D-J Jazairi, he wrote a good couple of books on Crusades, Mongols, Ruknuddin uh, al-Baybars, uh, Mamluks, solid kitabs. Then you've also got, uh, another one on this, ah, The Rise and Fall of Muslims. By Akbar Abadi. Oh my God, that book is madness. The Rise and Fall of Muslims. That is so thought-provoking. I've only read parts of the Muqaddimah of Ibn Khuldun. I want to read more of it. That's more about sociology, but that's also got history in there as well. So these are just some ideas, inshallah. They're good starts. And then I, what I do normally do when I read a book, 
they obviously give you the glossary, uh, not glossary, the bibliography at the back, normally. They, which books they consulted. Make a few notes of them. Just keep, get those books and slowly, slowly, slowly just increase. History is something which I've liked. I've just always been fond of it. Now there's another book which I'm reading. Can you read Urdu or Arabic? Um, oh, Molana, there's a book written by Molana Ismail Rehan Sab, Tarikh Ummat Muslima. It's the best book ever written in history other than the Arabic language. It's absolutely phenomenal. Tarikh Ummat Muslima. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's 12 years of effort consigned, uh, con, in, into books and constant effort every day, eight to 10 hours a day of writing and takhreej uh, and everything. It's the best book written. Mufti Taqi Sab said, hands down, this is the best thing ever written on history. It's absolutely mind blowing. But it, are we, are we, now just to translate that, that's a mammoth task, man. He's on his sixth volume. He's working on his seventh and eighth volume as we speak. Six volumes have already been printed. Alhamdulillah, I've got three. And yeah, it's next level, Alhamdulillah. He's a teacher in Jamiatul Rashid in Pakistan, I'm sure. He, I think he was Jamiatul Rashid. But anyway, yeah, that's really good. I just wanted to share that with you, Molana. It's in Urdu. They haven't got that in English yet. For me, I like reading stuff about Sahaba as well. There's a book written by called Hayatul Sahaba. Molana Yusuf Kandelvi. Hayatul Sahaba. That's mind blowing. Absolutely mind blowing. And then you have a lot of other stuff like Sira, Ar Rahiq al Makhtoum. Absolutely phenomenal. Rahik al And then there's another one, a condensed version of Rahik al it's, um, it's written as well by the same author. But I forgot where it's I've got it at home. I forgot. So, no, no, that's something else. That's, the, that's also good. That's also good. Uswai Rasul Akram is good. The Sublime Conduct of the Prophet. These are all different kitabs. I mean, there's so, so many. So, Sira is more of the life of the Prophet. History is everything other than the Prophet. That's what we generally categorize as Sira and Tarikh. But I like both. Any um, books, like obviously after the Prophet Muhammad um, certain empires um, after, mm -hmm. like Rashid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, there's one book written by uh, Muhammad Khudari al baq Muhammad Khudari al baq he wrote a book. Oh, it's on the, I'm trying to picture the name of it. So he's got one. He talks about all the. So like he starts off with the Banu Umayyah. Banu Umayyah, Banu Abbas. Then he talks about, for example, now uh, the Mamluks. He talks about the Ayyubids. He talks about, for example, now, um, in the, how it worked is that the Banu Umayyah ruled up until about 132 of 136. Then they got, got one by one got assassinated. And then Abdul Rahman from the Banu Umayyah went to Spain. Banu Abbas took position. Then after, while you had, then you had two simultaneous powers that were rising. Then you had obviously the Mamluks and the Ayyubids and you have all these little dynasties as well. So he writes quite extensively. Muhammad Khudri al bek yeah, yeah, the name was coming to me one second. It's called Durus. Is it? I think it's called Durus uh, fit Tarikh. It's translated now. I think it's Lessons in History. Muhammad Khudri al Bak. Yeah, Durus fit Tarikh.